clap. And so right now, right, we're going to continue that business message. We're talking about your personal branding and how to turn your passion into profit. And ultimately, right, that's what it's all about. We're all here as photographers. Many of us, this is our passion. Uh, and how do we turn this into a profit machine? And maybe you don't want to quit your business, right? I, mean, I was in the hallway talking to a bunch of you, and you're like, I'm working a part-time uh, job or a full-time job, and I just love doing this on the side. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. Uh, but there's no reason why you shouldn't be profitable. And that's something we should all march to anyway. Let's make money, and then you can go to more conferences. You can spend money on the toys that you want, that you have to have, right? So at least let's find a way to make money. Um, and for those of you, who, how many of you were here at Extreme last year? All right, so you remember Roberto Blake, I think he uh, blew all of us away from his hour and a half presentation with not a single slide on the screen. Uh, so I don't know if you were impressed with God was, because I can barely keep track of where I am 10 minutes from now, and I have no idea how we did it. So this year, I said, Roberto, you give me anxiety, you need to bring a slide there. <laughs> care what's on it, just bring a slide deck to keep me happy. Uh, so this man is committed to the creative community. Uh, I love working with like-minded individuals. He is one of us for sure. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Roberto Blake. You can't ask for a better intro than that. Thank you so much, Sal. Uh, you good. All right. How are you guys doing, Shutterfest? Yeah. Oh, wow, that is tremendous. So first of all, couldn't ask for a better intro, couldn't ask for a better host or a better event. So real quick, clap it up for yourselves and clap it up for our man, Sal Sincata, ladies and gentlemen. You know, when Sal asked me to come back to Shutterfest, uh, my mind was blown. I'm so grateful to be part of this community and to see so many like-minded people that want to go out there, create awesome things, share them with the world, whether that's part-time or full-time. And I think last year when we spoke, I told you guys a little bit about me. I told you a little bit about my story and the fact that I am, in fact, a creative entrepreneur. And my entire life, I've been a creative and I've watched creatives struggle with starving artist syndrome. People who wanted to do this so badly, so desperately, but they didn't feel it was practical. And sometimes that was just a matter of the era that they grew up in, uh, the people in their ecosystem, the, the town or the country or wherever they were from, telling them, no, that you can't. And that's really disheartening for someone like me because more than anything, part of my business is helping other creative professionals, people like you, every single one of you, get what you want out of this whether that's the ability to make more money so that you have more time to spend with your family or so that you can be a full-time parent and you can still do the thing you love and so that you can inspire your children to maybe do the thing that they love or so that maybe you can spend the time and the money that you've built building up the community around you or the local uh, businesses in your area helping them achieve their goals. So more than anything, I wanna help you guys create something awesome today and that's what I'm gonna do. So. If you're super excited about that, if I've got you pumped, if you're not sleepy, if this is not snooze fest, then just clap it up real quick. So we're talking about turning your passion into profit. Now for me, I think that going all in on your passion is one of the most practical things in the world. A lot of people would disagree with me on that, and they think that you should do something infinitely quote unquote more practical or more quote unquote stable or they don't think that passion is sustainable. And I would make the argument that if you don't know what it is you want, if you don't have something that's driving you, that's beating in your chest, then you're on the road to ruin because that's not sustainable. Doing something you hate because you need to make money, I think is the least sustainable thing in the world because you wake up with a sense of anxiety, you wake up with a sense of dread if you're me, and it could be really bad for you. And then you might be thinking about how to take shortcuts instead of how to get better. Is there anyone who's ever felt like that? Show of hands, anybody ever felt like that before? Right. Because we're creatives. We're the crazy ones. We're the weirdos. We're the people who make things. We're the ones who think differently. And because of that, that practical advice that everyone wants to give us doesn't apply. What we really need is people who can help us make our passion practical and make it profitable. And that's what I'm here to try to help all of you do today. So, uh, personal branding. Personal branding matters because I think all of you pretty much know this gentleman. I'm pretty sure all of you have a story about him that you could tell, right? Couple? Couple? Okay, so that's fun. Now, the thing is, a lot of us are here partly because in one way or another, we know and like and trust Mr. Sal Sincata. 
And that's very practical as well because whether you plan to be at your nine to five job for the rest of your life, you have a personal brand. Whether you choose to talk about it or toot your own horn as many creatives are afraid to do, you have a personal brand. Why? Because your name and your reputation, your body of work goes before you and other people are talking about you when you're not in the room, your clients, your customers, your employers, your coworkers. And so it's valuable for you to try to make sure that that narrative is as positive as possible because it's going to directly in, in, um, impact your profitability and your bottom line, your opportunities, because a reputation takes a lifetime to build and five minutes to destroy. So you need to make sure that everything that you're approaching and building your story, your personal brand, and that what people have to say about you is going to be positive and profitable. And that means that you have to think about it in a very precise way and you have to think about it very intentionally. Intentions matter, everyone. It really does. If someone knows that you have good intentions toward them, they're more likely to do business with you. If they know you, they like you, they trust you, they feel safe with you, they feel comfortable, they will come back over and over again and they will also refer people to you. That, that no like and trust factor, being able to trust the work that you do, but also the experience that you're going to create and that you're gonna respect and value them matters. And so a lot of us will go deeper and we'll go further into an ecosystem with Sal and we'll buy products. And then me of all people who never buys magazine subscriptions forever, is like, I'm now buying a, a Shutter magazine subscription because again, I just want to go deeper with Sal because I have that no like and trust factor. Even though photography is not my primary business, I'm going to take, I take so much inspiration. I find myself always struggling with whether I'm going to buy Shutter magazine whenever I walk into Barnes and Noble anyway, that I just decided to go all in and commit. And that was easy because I have that no like and trust actor because Sal made sure that his interactions and experiences with me in his personal brand, the same way he has with each and every one of you, impacted me to where I made a yet another buying decision. So that's how you go from getting in somebody's head and then making a connection with them emotionally. And then when you want to reach into their wallet, they're okay with it. <laughs> so today's session, it's going, to be, it's going to be practical, it's going to be actionable advice, it's going to be fun, it's going to be informative. So we're going to talk about defining your personal brand, because I think a lot of you, has anyone here struggled to even know what their personal brand is? Anybody like that? Oh, wow, quite a bit of hands. Okay, well, I'm going to help you figure that out. We're going to talk about aligning it to practicality. We're going to talk about some of the logistics and making that sustainable. We're going to talk about establishing your authority and credibility using a variety of tools, everything from how you do it in person to how you leverage technology and social media. We're going to talk about methods of monetizing a message, the actual way we make money. And then we're going to talk about something that I think almost no one in this space is truly talking about. We're going to talk about how you build vehicles that are profitable and possibly even investable around what you already have. Because I think a lot of you have a lot of things that you've created. You have a lot of knowledge, you have information that you haven't figured out how to commoditize, how to make a system around it and how to sell it to people. And that's why I refer to it as a vehicle. I refer to those things as a vehicle because they're not a destination, but they are going to get you where you want to go. Me and Sal had a great conversation about planting your flag. You have to know where you want to go, what you want to dominate, what you want to stake out for yourself but you do need a strong and powerful fast vehicle that can get you there. So we're gonna talk about that. I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, content strategy because I know a lot of you really enjoyed last year's presentation where I broke down social media stuff for you guys. I had some wonderful conversations with many of you out in the hall around that. We're gonna talk about uh, the strategies around that that convert and what is more profitable for you, some of you. Um, you're seeing some shifts in the ecosystem between Instagram and Snapchat. I'm not going to talk about what's practical for you there. I'm going to talk about maybe where you might want to do certain things with Facebook or even LinkedIn now. Huge opportunity for you guys as photographers with the changes they've made to LinkedIn for the commercial side of things. So I think that that's going to be extraordinarily helpful. And then finally, we're going to talk about your personal branding assets, what you need to have in place to really feel like you have a very powerful personal brand. And then we're going to talk about some social media strategies specifically and do a ton of Q and A because you guys love the Q and A, right? All right. Yeah. I love that too. Cause I love chaos. So that's what you can expect. And it's, I live for the chaos. It's like, it's like chaos is a ladder. Anybody know where that's from? Anybody know that reference? Chaos is a ladder, climb is all there is. So what is your personal brand? What is your story? We talked about the fact that your personal brand is the stories people are gonna tell around the water cooler. It's gonna be the story that every time you guys shoot a bride, every time you guys shoot senior portraits, it's gonna be the person talking to someone about what a wonderful experience that was or how God awful it was and why they're never gonna hire you again. So it's gonna be one of the two things and I think I know which one you'd prefer. So that's something you have to be able to, you know, set up in your mind, but you have to think about this. How are you going to introduce yourself to people 
And what do you want people who introduce you to say about you? Don't you want them to say that like, wow, the experience of working with so-and-so was so amazing. I've never had that experience. I thought that this was gonna be more difficult, but they were able to remove all my anxiety. I wasn't nervous anymore. I was so self-conscious about my smile and they got me to do it. I think that that's the experience that we wanna create. I think that everyone needs to understand that you're not selling photography. You're not selling pictures. You're selling an experience. You're selling the butterflies of a first date. You're selling Disneyland. And in doing that, you need to craft what that story is. You need to really think about if someone is going to introduce me on a stage like Shutterfest, what are they gonna have to say about me? I couldn't have asked for a better testimonial than the one that Sal gave me earlier. And so you need to think about what is the testimonial that people are gonna give about you? And even in the sense that you might be doing an interview, you might have an article written about you, what is the story? What is your about section of your website? What is your short bio? What is it that you're putting in those two or three lines that you get in Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat to tell people who you are and why it matters to them and what they're gonna get out of it? Because in your personal brand story, while it is about you, it's about the value that you create for other people. It's about how you're going to create awesome experiences for them, how you're gonna create tremendous value, how you're gonna grow their business, how you're going to make them look better, how you're gonna represent them. That is what your story needs to communicate. As much as it is about you, it's in the context of what you deliver for other people. So I really want you to keep that in mind. What do people say about you when you're not there? More importantly, what do you want them to say? I want you guys, when you leave here to do an exercise, I want you to think about three to five adjectives that you want as descriptors of who you are and what your value is to other people. I want you to think about things like, I want someone to say, you know what, that person is 100% authentic. That person is 100% real. That person has so much tremendous empathy. I want you to think about the words that you want people to ascribe to you as a human being and as a creative professional, and as a service provider. I want you to think, like in the same way that brand wise, I'm gonna actually throw something at you. When you guys think about Apple, what are some singular, singular words that come to mind? Uh, gentleman in the front row with the tremendous beard. What are some things you think of when you, yep, you with the hair. What are some things you think of when you associate the brand Apple? What's like one word that comes to mind? Overpriced. overpriced. I love it. I agree. I agree. I have one of their most overpriced, overhyped pieces of tech here, and I love it. Technology. Technology. Great. You. Design. Design. Oh, and there goes my earpiece. Yep, so much for loving chaos, right? Um, no, but design, aesthetic, simplicity, innovation. Well, not so much anymore. Uh, sorry, sorry, Apple, sorry, Steve. Um, but no, so right, you want to have these positive adjectives ascribed to you, but you need to be intentional and you need to be purposeful in what that looks like. And you also need to think about what phrases and so on and so forth, because even using them in your own narrative then creates a culture of how you prefer to be presented and that means that people are going to um, you know, adapt that as well. So I put up here in my slide, for those of you to get this afterward, and also for those of you who want to take notes, you can feel free here, but I do want you to ask yourself some questions. Now, I'm not gonna sit here and run through all those because that's what the slides are for, but I wanna have a conversation about self-awareness because self-awareness is what's gonna grow your business and grow your brand, and while you guys are taking pictures and snapshots of that, what I wanna do is I wanna take this opportunity to tell you um, about something that me and Sal were talking about earlier that I think defines the overall to success, whether you're a personal brand or business. Confidence plus consistency multiplied by creativity equals winning. That is literally the formula that we have ascribed for success in all things. And that confidence is gonna come from self-awareness. It's gonna be coming from knowing your strengths, your weaknesses, how you're going to adapt, how you're going to evolve, and what people want from you, and who you want to connect with, who you want to deliver value for. We talked about last year the fact that not every one of you is going to want to work with every single one of the 7.4 billion human beings on the planet. Some of you are not gonna get along with them. Okay, that's a real thing. Think about what community you want to belong to. Think about who you want as your clients. And it's about doing that so you can position yourself to only work with people on your own terms that share your values, share your culture, sell your vision, or can afford you. And I think that for many of you, 
that's a genuine concern, right? Anyone here still dealing with wondering whether or not they're still servicing people who really can't afford what they want to charge or what they should be charging? Because I know we talked about charging what you're worth earlier. Um, Elise Benin did a great presentation on that. Is there anyone who still feels like they're not charging what they're worth because their current clientele can't support it? Anyone going through that right now? Show of hands. Okay, we got a couple. Oh, we got quite a few people going through that right now. Well, positioning yourself with your personal brand through this self-awareness helps you get into a better ecosystem of people that might actually be able to afford the value that you really want to do, or through self-awareness, you might be able to figure out ladders or products or funnels that you can create to where it's like, okay, this is something I have for this level of clientele, this is something I have for this group, and here is where I really want to expand. It's gonna take me to the whole next level, and I need to create something viable that gets me there, or I need to scale these things enough to afford me to experiment with that. So I think that that's very practical for you. So you have to figure out what is it that you're good at, what's really exciting to you, what's gonna drive you so that you have that passion underlying to sustain what you're doing so that you keep taking risk, so that you keep acting from a position of confidence. If you're doing something you don't enjoy, if you're doing something that doesn't excite you, how could you possibly approach it with the confidence required? How can you possibly wake up and justify to yourself spending time you will never get back doing that every day to be consistent? How is that going to push and challenge your creativity to the next level? So you see, if you don't have that self-awareness, if you aren't doing something that truly matters to you in your hearts of hearts, you're setting an artificial ceiling that you'll never be able to break. It's very difficult to do, and it's not something that I want for you. I want every one of you to feel driven and confident, and I want you to feel comfortable to take risk, because on the other side of taking those tremendous risks and being consistent and not being daunted by anything resembling failure, that's where your greatest success, that's where your true power is going to come from. And if it's personal to you, if it means something to you, if it's something that you don't feel is a chore to spend your time on, you will have the intestinal fortitude, you will have the mental discipline to be consistent at, and it won't feel like a struggle. It won't feel truly like work. It will feel like you're fulfilling your purpose. And I think that that is probably the most practical thing in the world there is, is fulfilling and living for your purpose. So, Roberto, that's great. That's very inspiring. Practicality. Okay, let's get to it. Align your passion to practicality. What do you really want and how are you going to get there? Self-awareness and knowing what you want, where you want to plant your flag. That's important because it sets a destination. But having a destination isn't good enough. You actually need a roadmap to get there. You actually need to know what steps are required. When you were planning your flight and your trip, you knew that St. Louis, you knew that Shutterfest was your destination. But there were a whole lot of logistics that went into getting here. Were there not? You had to book a flight. You had to you know, set up a hotel room. You had to figure out what gear you were gonna bring. You had to figure out what gear you were gonna leave behind. You had to figure out all of these different things that were gonna add up to the experience that you wanted. And so, I feel that there is something you can break down to figure out what practicality really looks like for whatever endeavor you want to do in developing your personal brand because this is gonna guide your actions. This is one you're definitely gonna to wanna to take notes on that you're gonna to wanna to screenshot. And I believe that it's about revenue, relevance, and reality. I believe that knowing how you're going to make your money, specifically how you're going to make your money matters. I really, truly want you guys to think about that. What am I doing that's gonna make me money? Have I diversified it enough? Have I made it practical and sustainable for me? Have I diversified enough? Have I overextended? What's making me the most money? What's the 80-20 rule? What am I spending the least amount of time on to make the most money? That's what practicality looks like when we're talking about revenue. I also want you to prioritize what I refer to as revenue generating activities. Are you spending time on things that don't make you money? If you are, you need to audit yourself. You need to shut that crap down. I know that it's fun to scroll through Instagram and Snapchat, but if you're not getting motivation or inspiration for an execution for something you're getting paid for, you cut that crap out, you spend that 30 minutes on business development and prospecting clients because if you are not spending, if you're worried about, is there anyone here who's saying I don't make enough money? Okay, so keep those hands up, keep those hands up. Um, okay, um, gentlemen over here. How much time per week are you spending prospecting new clients? I'm working through referrals most 
You're working through from referrals mostly, which means that that could be feast or famine because you don't have control over those referrals. But what if you spent a half hour to an hour every day if after you eliminate any time-wasting activity, just prospecting clients so that you can try and close? You would probably get at minimum, if you were doing that, two to three new clients a week, bare minimum, right? Would d dramatically impact your bottom line. So for everybody here, in terms of a revenue generating activity, in terms of an action item you live with today, I want you to leave with this thing. And for anybody who is you know, getting the audio replay of this or what have you, if you take nothing else away from this, spend 30 minutes to an hour every single day, Monday through Friday, seven days a week if you can pull it off, whatever, but at least Monday through Friday, actually doing business development, actually prospecting new clients or creating some form of lead generation instead of waiting for people to come to you, I want you to take the notion of build it and they will come. I want you to walk it out to the backyard. I want you to get the double barrel and I want you to replay the scene from Old Yeller. That's what I want for you. <laughs> That's what we can do with build it and they will come. Make what you do relevant to people. Okay, so you guys are creatives. You're photographers. Congratulations. You can make things that don't suck. You can make things that will make a difference in the impact in someone's business, someone's life, someone's personal brand. Primary example, I'm a speaker. It's tremendous for me to know that anybody here could take a gorgeous headshot of me. In fact, the entire weekend, that's pretty much all I've been experiencing is people taking tremendous, beautiful headshots of me that are gonna help me grow my personal brand and my business because it's gonna be much better than me you know, pulling this thing out of my pocket and then saying, yeah, this is photography, right? I mean, real talk. It's like anything you guys shoot is gonna be much better than so you have to make what you do relevant to people. You have to understand that you're trying to impact their life or impact their bottom line, which means you have to have empathy. You have to understand what it is they want from you. And then you have to present not, hey, you're buying photos. It's like, no, you're buying a solution to a problem. You're buying great, beautiful photography that's gonna help your uh, floral business. You're buying great, beautiful photography and drone shot videos that are going to grow the business that you get to your venue and you get you booked for more weddings, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, this is gonna show off that rental property that you have and you're gonna get more people booking it for your short-term rentals. That's super practical and you have to present it in terms of what's in it for them. What's in it for them really matters. What are the practical logistics of your brand? How much time are you going to be spending on these revenue generating activities? How much time do you spend on creating awareness around what you do? How much time do you spend in doing your marketing, etc.? Anyone here say, I don't have enough time to do any of these things? Anybody? Oh wow, really? Okay. But for those of you who might be you know, a little shy about admitting that you say you don't have enough time, what I would say aside from the auditing your time and you know, you know, not scrolling through Instagram and Snapchat, what I would say is anything that does not require a human touch should be handled by robots. The robots are coming. In many cases, the robots are here. And I think we should all embrace our Terminators and our digital overlords because they're inevitable. I mean, you know, I'm just, I'm ready for it. We have the drones and everything like that. I'm just waiting for them to get the T-1000 up and running. And I'm gonna figure out how to make it do yard work. <laughs> so I don't wanna do that anymore. So I think that anything that you personally do not need to do that doesn't require a human touch, you automate it. Anything that does require a human touch but doesn't require your specific creative talents, doesn't require your brain capacity, doesn't require your eye for visual aesthetic, Outsource it. Give it to an intern. Give it to an intern. Give it to an apprentice. Give it to an assistant. Hire a virtual assistant. Find some way to take that off your plate so you can do the thing that you care about the most that you can charge the most money for. Again, prioritize revenue generating activities. It's always going to come back to that. So let's talk about establishing credibility and authority. There are a lot of ways to do that. Individual credibility and authority matters because we're talking about personal relationships. Many of you say, in fact, how many of you right now, within the last 30 days, have gotten any referral business specifically? In the last 30 days? Show of hands? Keep those up for a little bit. The far, if you look around, it's the far majority of you have gotten referral business. The one on one credibility that you had with those individuals is what drove referral business to you, right? So that means that your credibility and your authority matters. 
What I want you to do with your personal brand in regard to digital and when you're out in public is I want you to think about how you scale that authority. If people only knew you the way that they met you in person, they would like you, they would trust you, they would work with you, right? So what vehicles, what things can you use to help you scale that? We talked about the no like and trust factor. I think all of you know that that's real. I don't have to sell you on the religion of no like and trust. We work with and we buy from people that we know more often than not. Most of you, your clients work with you over someone else because of that relationship and because they know you, they like you, they trust you, they rely on you. And the minute that that's not true, they'll go to someone else. Right now, they might be paying you more than they would pay for a competitor because they don't want to take the risk of working with someone that they don't know, someone that they don't necessarily like or enjoy the experience of, even if they're cheaper. It's like, you know what? That might be cheaper, but the experience I have is so much better over here, i.e. why I keep buying overpriced Apple crap. <laughs> so it's the experience. That's what we're selling. We're not selling our actual product. We're not selling that. All we're selling is the fact that we have this experience and that you want that from us. You know us, you like us, you trust us. Your overall body of work absolutely is gonna to contribute to that. Why this build and enable come? I'm not saying don't build a website, don't build a platform, don't build a tremendous body of work. I'm not saying don't focus on quality. What I'm saying is don't rely on it solely to do all the work for you. You need to connect, you need to be human. And I want you to use systems to buy back your time to be more human where it counts which is where you're going to build your credibility, your reputation with somebody, even if it's one-on-one. -on -one. And when you need to go further and build those one-on-one -on -one relationships, having digital platforms that scale you, having people who would have never found you, but are looking for a solution to a problem in Google, in YouTube, in social media, and then you providing that solution, they now know who you are. And if that solution worked for them, and if they keep going back to you, they're gonna start to like you. They're gonna start to trust you. And then working with you is a formality. It's not a matter of if, it becomes a matter of when. And so that's why you need to develop and put as much time in developing your personal brand as you have in building your body of work and your portfolio. Because it's great work, but if no one sees it, how much does that really matter? If no one sees that great work, they can't buy it. And more importantly, if they don't know what a great, tremendous, awesome human being that you actually are, even if you do this great work, they don't know if they're gonna like working with you. They don't know if getting that result is gonna be worth the crucible of dealing with person X, Y, or Z. And you need to make sure that you're making them feel comfortable, that you're making them feel safe with you, and that they can trust you, that when they pay you, when they rely on you, when they trust you, when they put their brand in your hands, you're not gonna make them look stupid. So, that's important. Part of that is providing unique value, Many of you, one of the things you guys are gonna have in, in spades over a lot of people outside of the creative world is that for you guys, developing the visual branding aspect of a strong personal brand is gonna be relatively easy because if you don't have the skills on your own because you're a creative, you're already connected to people who are that can help you. There are plenty of you right now that if you don't know coding and how to build a website, well, you're in a creative community. You know plenty of people who can do that. I actually met um, a woman, Deb, who actually does that for people here, and it didn't even necessarily initially occur to her that she should be working with people already in her own community to deliver that value. I've met other people here who have a background in graphic design, and it hasn't occurred to them that all the photographers they know might need a logo or a watermark. You can use the advantage of being part of a collective creative community to supplement any weakness you might have in your brand. You can find collaborative partners. There are plenty of people here who are social media savvy or marketers that can take that thing off your plate. So as creatives, you have a tremendous advantage, not only in the fact that you can make things that don't suck on your own, but you know plenty of other people who can do it for you. So I think that that really matters. One of the other things is in building your authority. There are many of you who don't feel that you're an expert in anything. Guess what? That's okay. To the person starting at zero, you are a golden god. I really think that the far majority of you in this audience, and we will get to this, we'll get to this later in the presentation, but the far majority of you here have a course in you that you could teach and you could be charging hundreds of dollars for because it can be for absolute beginners. And the thing is, maybe it doesn't go broad market appeal. Maybe it doesn't move 10,000 units. 
But you know what? A couple hundred sales at the right price is a six-figure business, and I don't think that's something to sleep on. I think a lot of you have that in you, but it hasn't occurred to you because you're hung up on the word expert instead of the word practitioner. And there, everyone here is a practitioner. And being a practitioner, being someone that's actually in the market, anyone who's made a dollar doing a thing has the right to talk to somebody who's made zero. So think about that. And while you're at it, take the word competition and repeat the old yellow scenario from earlier. There's no such thing as competition. Anybody here ever worry about saying, well, the market is saturated because everyone's a photographer now? Anybody here concerned about that? Because you know what the differentiator is in saturation? For one thing, in any market, ah, there's more chaos for me. In any market, that's what I get for moving around because I like being active, I don't like being static. Um, but in any given market, there will be saturation. But it's irrelevant because all you have to do is be better or different or create unique value for people. All you have to do is be better, different, create unique value for people or give people something that they weren't even aware that they wanted in the way that fits best for them. Because the thing that is so interesting about saturation is that most of what's in the market is crap, number one. And number two, every market can be disrupted. Every ecosystem can be disrupted. Everybody who is at the top of the mountain is waiting for a new competitor to sit there, wait in the shadows for them to get soft and lazy and all of a sudden, pop! That's it. You got knocked off the top of the mountain. Give me the championship belt. That's all you're waiting for. That's all you're waiting for. So there's always a tremendous opportunity for you where you're worried about saturation. Don't worry about it. Most of what's out there is not great and even if it was, you can carve out a small enough niche in the market to make a very profitable income by reaching out specifically to the people that want to work with you for a reason. One-to-one -one personal equity because maybe all those big people, they're just a number to them. They don't have that personal investment. They don't feel like they matter. By selling an experience disproportionately and by empathizing and by caring about the other person, market saturation becomes irrelevant because you don't need market dominance. You just need to be able to stake your claim. You just need to have some part of what you're doing and the people who are crazy, stupid, excited about working with you aren't gonna go anywhere else. So, strategies for uh, creating unique value and this slide is going to come up again and again for a reason. Building that authority, being, building authenticity, building awareness, becoming known. The strategy that I like is read, watch, listen. Not everyone here will feel comfortable on video or producing video. That's okay. Some of you have a voice for radio and can be the greatest podcast announcer of all time. And that's real. And so you should play to your strengths. If you don't feel comfortable on camera, you could always just use slides and you could use your great speaking voice and the way that you clearly communicate and articulate things to your advantage and then use your visuals. Especially as a photographer, you probably can do some really great slides that are going to be blowing people away because most people do these boring as hell slides and PowerPoints, which is why I've been so resistant to them in the past. But then I just figured, oh, I'll just make awesome slides and call it a day. <laughs> so that's why I believe in read, watch, listen. If you don't have something that you think people are going to be enticed enough to watch, do you have information that's good enough and valuable enough to listen to while they're working out in the gym? Or do you have something that they will read on their smartphone or tablet or whatever while they're on a plane? You, have, you can have a lot of vehicles for this. Primary example, Shutter Magazine started as a digital publication, was more than good enough and viable enough to go to print. Print experiences obviously still matter to people. A lot of your clients obviously still want prints. So the thing is having something that's in print can actually be a viable option. And that's a lot of credibility, especially when you're talking about books. If anyone here has worried that they can't put out a book, I've got great news for you. Kindle books, ebook publishing cost almost nothing. You get a tremendous overhead. You keep about 70% of your profit margin on it. And by the way, in the early part of the book, just create a link that says free, free resources um, included with this book. And it's a download link and capture their email address. Congratulations, I just gave you a strategy to grow your email list exponentially. You're welcome. So that's how you do the ebook thing.
And the thing is, if you don't want to like look bad aside from your tremendous, beautiful photography being on the cover of that ebook, it's very affordable to hire a designer that knows Adobe InDesign and can work all of that out for you or knows Apple uh, iBooks Publisher, so on and so forth. If you want to learn this on your own and absorb all of the cost, then that's pretty straightforward. I'm sure someone has a YouTube tutorial for it. Um, and then in terms of going to print, if you really want to do a print book because you want that tremendous credibility, then what I would suggest is you use Amazon's CreateSpace. By the way, hashtag not sponsored by Amazon. But Amazon, if you're listening, reach out. <laughs> so you have the options here with something that's readable because there's still people out there, especially in the buying market that skews a lot older, which by the way also skews more affluent. You know, that could matter. So I still think that reading is worthwhile. Reading is uh, fundamental. I think that's what the kids are saying, right? Videos. Video is the experience of you in the real world, but at scale. I think I said that last year, I can't remember. But it's true, because if I never get to meet you because I don't happen to be in the you know, beautiful city of St. Louis, then maybe I can connect with you because you stumble across a video that solves a problem for you. And then I get to connect with you that way via social media and we build a relationship and I build no like and trust with you because video is the next best thing to dealing with me in person. Live streaming Q&A can prove your credibility if you're trying to become a thought leader, if you're trying to become a subject matter expert, showing that you can handle the chaos of live Q&A, that actually would matter and that's meaningful. And then obviously, beyond the digital realm, you could always do public speaking you can always find yourself on a stage and all of a sudden you have people hanging on to your every word taking a bunch of notes and uh, I can tell you from experience that that's actually pretty cool so <laughs> podcast podcast matter because um, podcasts and audiobooks and audio only webinars matter because for those of you who are still at a nine-to-five and this is a side hustle thing for you guess what while you're working you can be passively listening to and consuming content that's gonna get you out of your nine to five job or is gonna help feed that side hustle while you're working. So you can be consuming that content and you don't have to worry about, oh, I gotta minimize that YouTube video. Oh, you, you know, you can just go ahead and you can have a podcast or an audio book or an audio only webinar. And it's also very practical for people who are on the go who are you know, working out, running, traveling, doing all those things. Um, so that's actually very practical. And it's great that I brought Read, Watch, Listen because it leads into uh, what I think is the really valuable thing that you're all here for is monetizing your message. So if you want to make more money, show of hands real quick. Oh, look at that, everybody. Okay, cool. Because if you were making enough money and it's like I was gonna be like, hey, you know. But there's several methods of monetizing. This one you're really gonna want the notes for because all these things are practical and they're scalable and I'm gonna really get into the weeds on it. it is overwhelmingly I think the majority of this presentation for me is the thing I'm really excited about uh, because personal branding matters building authority with people matters because at the end of the day if people don't trust your information if they don't like you monetizing is something that's not going to be viable it's not gonna be practical if people don't know who you are they don't like you they don't trust you how could you reach into their wallet if otherwise so I think that We've covered the practical and the philosophical part of that. This is where execution starts to happen. So obviously I'm on YouTube and I more than anybody know that there's a lot of power in being able to generate passive income through YouTube. I also use the scale in real world business via one-on-one -on -one coaching. I also use it as the credibility and authority to build a private invite only membership group uh, that has monthly recurring fees. Uh, I'm also moving into like systematizing my information. Systematizing your information matters because even if people can consume free content for you, do they want to hunt for it? How many of you spend like hours a week just hunting through and consuming information? Anybody go through that? Like just real talk. Okay, yes. Okay, so if you had something and it's all in, one pray, all in one place, all at once, that's extremely practical because it's a time saver. And if you have a reference, it's a time saver. Do you know that's why I still to this day buy physical books? I still buy physical books because I want a reference. I want to be able to go to my bookshelf. I want to be able to pull something out. I want to be able to look at it. I want to hold it in my hands. I want to be able to go through the index and go specifically to the chapter that applies to the problem that I'm having today. It's why I still encourage you guys to even do print books is because I know as a consumer that it still matters to me. 
I still work with that every single day. So I think it's still practical for you guys to build a book or a tangible physical product because it would matter to somebody. I think it's practical for all of you, even if you give information away for free, to build a course because who wants to hunt and peck through so much stuff if I could just have a resource that makes it concise and systematizes it for me so that I could walk through beginning to end or I could cherry pick the problem that I have right now, the thing that's holding me back. So I really believe in that. Um, many of you as photographers are not taking advantage of your unused inventory of throwaway photos and selling them on stock media sites as digital assets. Many of you could be also making presets and templates and other things and you could be selling and commoditizing those in digital platforms. Um, you know, a lot come to mind, obviously can stock photo, iStock, Adobe stock, none of whom are sponsoring this talk right now. Um, so I think that you guys could be selling there and make some additional passive income. And guess what? It could literally just be a few snapshots that you're doing while you're traveling, while you're at conferences or events. It could be contextual. And I would encourage you to also think about concepts and how you uh, sell concepts in terms of stock photos because literally I feel like a lot of you could get a white background, set up all the lights, go to the dollar store, buy a bunch of stuff because as a marketer, what I need is I need, steal this idea, I need piggy banks, I need rulers, I need like colored pencils all strewn about, I need a lot of these things against a white background so that I can cut it out and do some Photoshop wizardry and sell an idea. I really do. And people buy those things by the droves and there's a missed opportunity there. You can also use a uh, video and you can use information, whether it's YouTube, whether it's a podcast to build credibility, but also to do affiliate marketing, which is most of you guys have uh, a lot of expensive camera gear. And how many of you realize that you could be getting a four to 12% commission every time someone buys a camera on your recommendation? Anybody here aware of that fact? Like that's, that should be mind blowing for some of you that every time somebody buys a really expensive camera, you could be pocketing maybe up to uh, 80 to 200 bucks every time someone buys an expensive camera just by your recommendation, your link. So some of you could be doing product reviews, but if you don't wanna do product reviews, that's fine because all you still have to do is give some great information, show a process, show a technique, and then just mention that if you want the same gear that I use, there's a link for you. You don't even have to review the product, you're just showing these are the products that produce the results I have. If you want the same results, maybe you buy the same stuff. We had so many people uh, that taught courses here today that recommend lighting kits to us, that recommend uh, spotlights, that recommend various different things, C-stands, all these different things that we could use, and they're not getting any direct profit or revenue from that, and they could. And so again, it's a dramatic missed opportunity. And by the way, with hundreds or thousands of people looking for the solutions that you guys can offer by you giving away information for free, on the back end, you could be making hundreds of dollars a day through affiliate marketing of various products that you actually believe in, that you've actually bought, that you actually use, that have made you money. So I would definitely recommend that. You could also, if you're selling an online course yourself, set up an affiliate program that then gives you a sales force. If you guys have a course deep inside your chest as far as a process that you feel that you could either make this really accessible for beginners, because by the way, the one thing about being an expert sometimes is that when you're sitting at, on the top of the mountain, that could be really intimidating for folks. But if you're an intermediate, if, or if you feel like you're on the journey or the path, for the person starting at zero, what you're doing is identifiable and it seems attainable to them. So you still have the right to teach, even if you don't consider yourself an expert yet, even if you don't feel you have a decade of experience yet, you have the right to teach because it's possible that someone who has a decade in has too far back to remember what it's like to have nothing and you might be able to relate to them in a much better way and that might feel much more comfortable for them. So understand that the marketplace will decide whether you're good enough to teach. That may not be up to you. The marketplace may decide that you are good enough to teach because you have someone every day in your life that you're probably solving some kind of question for at some point because they do respect you and they do look up to you. And it doesn't have to be a million people. It doesn't have to be 100,000 people. It doesn't have to be 10,000 people for you to make this practical, for you to make this profitable. It just doesn't. So I want you to you know, get past that. So those are some of the practical ways that you can monetize a message, that you can commoditize your information. As creatives, you guys have a disproportionate advantage. You know how to make things. You know how to turn your thoughts into things, things for which there is a demand, things for which we care about. You guys capture moments in time. 
You guys sell ideas, you sell memories, you sell moments, not photographs. You sell experiences and you guys are good at it. I've watched you, I've seen you, I've looked at some of your work in the Shutterfest community, I looked at you guys on social media, I've been walking around peeking over your freaking shoulders with your cameras. I know it's good and I only am wondering, are you charging enough? <laughs> so, profitability vehicles for your brand. We talked about a YouTube channel. The way that you can make money on YouTube, uh, and I'll just tell you flat out that AdSense is not always great. CPM is, you know, it's okay. You need probably to make a living off of that. I would say you have to do half a million to a million views per month to make between three and five thousand dollars. But guess what? Your goal is not to live off of that. Your goal is to take the information you have, take it into a five-minute chunk create value for somebody, and then maybe they do business with you or maybe they buy a course or maybe they buy an affiliate thing. And in the meantime, you're building credibility, you're building authority, you're getting noticed, you're getting attention, your name is out there. And on the back end, if nobody buys, you made a few bucks. And the work is already done. You spent five minutes shooting this, maybe 10, 15 minutes editing it, it's out into the world. And then a year from now, it might still be making you another 20 bucks a month while you're asleep. So that's practical. Podcasts can do the same thing for you. Podcasts are great because again, passive listening. You can get sponsorships for these podcasts. You can uh, use affiliate marketing. You can still sell a product or service. You can still sell a course. You are putting information out for which there is a demand and you're getting people to again, know, like, and trust you. Blogs and digital publications. Shutter Magazine was a digital magazine. And you know what? Eventually it was able, within a short period of time, to become a print magazine. So it is a profitable vehicle because why? Not only can you sell the actual thing itself, but you could also run ads in it and you could also get sponsors for it. And so you can do that. And again, you still have the ability within this publication to market your service as a photographer, to market your uh, service as a drone pilot, to market your services as a videographer, whatever it is you're doing. But also with the venues, with the brands that you already have a relationship with, especially locally, you can also use this as a vehicle of advertising for them, which allows you to go deeper on the relationship and then justify taking more photos for them because you want to put a spot in the ad in the publication or what have you. So this is another vehicle for you. Online courses and training. One of the other beautiful things about online courses and training is that in your online courses, you still can market your services. You still can upsell from there. You also still could actually reach out to a sponsor and give them a plug in your course and charge a premium for that. You can also remind them that you have an email list that you've grown, hopefully before your launch, and you can sell against that. You also can do affiliate marketing within your course for products you believe in because maybe they need to buy a certain kit to be able to accomplish the things that you're outlining in the course. Maybe they need specific lights or specific lenses or cameras or accessories to be able to accomplish the thing you're doing, especially if you're teaching something like lighting or strobes, they may need these specific things to accomplish the technique. So you have an opportunity there. Live video training and webinars. Live video training and webinars are great because the only people who opt in and give you an email address for a live training are people who have the money to buy something because nobody can give up an hour of time for training if they're not already in the market. Uh, one of my favorite films of all time with Alec Baldwin is Glenn Gary Glenn Ross. Anyone ever, coffee's for closers only. Anybody ever remember that? It was like tremendous film, one of my favorite films. And the one thing that's interesting about it is I remember a line where he said, if they're on the lot, he was talking about real estate, if they're on the lot, they want to buy. No one has an hour to commit to a technical training and a Q&A if they're not in the buying market. Nobody squares away an hour of their precious, valuable time that they could be playing with their kids, you know, they could be spending time with their significant under, they could be spending time growing their business, prospecting leads, or watching Game of Thrones. No one's assigning that value of time if they're not in the buying market. So it's a great qualifier for leads. Obviously, public speaking in workshops, once you've established credibility, once you are out there, once you're known, it's actually easier to acquire those things and it can be very lucrative and very profitable for you. But even if it's not directly profitable and it's being covered cost, travel, etc., you then, if you build other vehicles, which is why you should do multiple vehicles, if you have a course, you can sell it. If you have a book, you could get the, uh, the event to buy the books and you can do a signing and you could do a book signing. They could order a certain number of books. So it's very practical having a book products and merchandise, 
that is also a thing. If you built a brand, if you built a community, if you built a culture, people will want to rep that culture. I see many of you with Shutterfest uh, gear on because you want to be part of the community and you want to rep that. So it's a very practical thing if you've built that. Even if it's a small number of people, even if it's 200 people, I think there are about maybe four or 500 people in this room. Well, that's enough, isn't it? That is something. That is better than zero. Much better than zero. So we're going back to read, watch, listen. And I won't drill this down too much again, but I think I've uh, driven the point home that whatever your skill set is, whether it's reading, whether it's watching or listening, I prefer to tackle all three, but I'm a madman who likes to outwork people. So that may not be for everybody. But the reality is that you have to go to people in the way that they respect, in the way that they appreciate, in the way that makes them comfortable, in the way that they want to consume. Not all of you want to or have the time to specifically engage with a video or an article because you're very busy people and you should be out there creating or you're trying to learn or you're trying to edit your photos. But while you're editing your photos, you can listen to a podcast. Some of you, you can't listen for long periods of time and consume information and retain it. Some of you need to read it. Reading comprehension is your skill set. That's great. So that means that that needs to be presented and that needs to be an option that's available. You just have to prioritize what your strengths are and decide what combination of this you're going to do. I prioritize video because I feel that I'm my best when I'm in person and when I connect with people. And the closest I can get to that is video and live streaming if I'm not there. So I use that as my top level piece of content. And from that, I either myself or I hire somebody to extract the best nuggets and then either put together an article or a slide deck, and then there's something that people who want to consume by reading can have that works for them. And then, if it makes sense, I can extract the audio or I could revisit that thing and go deeper because maybe I covered the main points of something in five or 10 minutes, but maybe I need to get granular for 20 minutes and maybe that's better in audio while someone's working out or taking their run. So I just feel that more than anything, do not romanticize, do not get caught up. Give people the option of how they consume your content. Give them the option of how they build a relationship with you. And with that, in regard to that, in social media, uh, in creating content that does convert for people, it's going to be on their own terms. So knowing where you need to go in order to convert somebody, knowing whether audio converts for them better, video converts for them better, reading converts for them better, know your community. Do not sit there and just pull data and statistics and averages and say, oh, well, the average person watches a video for this long. That person is not the average. May they might be a weirdo like you or me. So maybe they think differently. And maybe if you empathize and you listen to them, you can figure that out and figure out what's going to work for your community, what's going to work for your viewers, what's going to work for your customers, because they're not just anybody. So they're not just a number to you, I hope not. So don't treat them like one by obsessing over averages and statistics as those of us who are analytical thinkers or want to do. Be human first, and that's how you're going to figure out content that converts. So there's a thing that uh, many people are fond of saying, I'm one of them. We like to use the word hustle. Anybody here a fan of the hustle, of hustle culture, of just getting out there and putting in the work? Anybody like that? Anybody? Okay, yeah, we got a couple of people. When I was a track runner, I heard this truly put into context before I was ever doing the creative entrepreneurship thing. And in, in that terms, the context of hustle means to move purposely toward a defined goal with a sense of urgency. That's how I came up with Create Something Awesome today is that I want you to create something meaningful of value. I want you to have a destination. I want you to have a plan in mind. I want you to pursue that with urgency. I want you to have a clearly defined goal that you are working toward each and every single day with a sense of urgency and purpose. That means making it a priority. And so, with regard to that and with regard to your content strategy, you need to purposefully be looking at reviews, reveals, and resources. Reviews, reveals, and resources are what are going to kill it for you and they're what's gonna convert. We all know that product reviews, anybody here look at a review online before they bought a piece of camera gear? That's what I thought. Because we're getting ready to make a buying decision and the thing that relieves anxiety is seeing how someone else that we might trust or that we find credible is going to present this thing, what their experience is with it. I know that I actually looked at a lot of people's reviews before I bought the Panasonic GH5, which is recording this session right now. And it's been working out great for me because I looked at multiple sources of information that I trust to see what the pros and cons were. And your community, your audience is going to do that too. And that's why it's important to build your personal brand so that when you recommend something, 
something. When you do something, when you put something out there, they're going to respect it, they're going to trust, and they're going to come to you first. They're going to come to you first. For many of you, you already have this relationship with your friends and family. Whenever they want to know something technical, they come to you. Whenever they want headshots, they come to you. Whenever they want something filmed or photographed, they come to you. Sometimes uh, you don't like that, but you know, it is what it is because they trust you. They know you. They like your work. You know, whether you like working with them or not is, you know, another thing, but you have that credibility. So when you review something, when you give a recommendation, it's taken seriously. When you reveal your process, when you reveal your process, that's really your power. That's your power because results are just a byproduct of a process. Everyone seems to respect results, but not enough people respect the process of the work that it takes to get there. How many of you feel that your clients or employers don't respect how hard you work to get to the end result that they purchased? A lot of people, right? And it's because they have no idea. But I think in revealing some of your process, maybe not your secret sauce, but at least in some way demonstrating and showcasing how difficult it is, how unique it is, and the fact that they just can't do it, probably lets you raise your prices and probably buys you a little bit of a pass and a little bit of respect. And if nothing else, it establishes some of your credibility. Because again, results are just a byproduct. And often, a lot of people present results to us, but they can't explain to us how they got there. And that makes it really hard to trust what they're showing us and whether they produced it or whether it's credible, or whether it's viable. But once you see a process and you can see that, seeing is believing. And I think as people who are visually creative, we can all agree that that's very real. Resources that no one else is providing. If you are the go-to person, if you're the go-to guy or gal to know about X, Y, or Z, that is leverage and authority and credibility. You don't even have to be the best, by the way. You just have to be the person that they can reach. You just have to people be the person that is accessible to them. Because there are a lot of people that are the best at what they do and you can never get a hold of them. They're completely inaccessible. Some of them have a really big head and they just don't want to talk to anybody and they forgot where they came from. They forgot that they didn't get there alone. If you are the alternative to that, even if you are worlds away from that guru or that expert or that professional or whatever title they're, and whatever airs and whatever crowns they're giving themselves today, I don't know, um, then guess what? For the person that is reaching out to you, it means the world to them that you gave them the time of day and that you were willing to help them when no one else was and you became their resource. So I would encourage you to look at yourself and look at the thing that maybe even you're afraid to sell from the perspective of you're giving absolute value, you're creating awesome value, you are helping them, you are a resource for them more than anything. So we're running into um, a little bit of time and I wanna leave a lot of it for Q&A. We're gonna run through personal branding assets. This is another one of those slides that you're gonna to wanna to take photos of, you wanna to wanna to take notes. But I think personal branding assets are very straightforward in a lot of ways. I still believe that everyone here needs a website. I really believe that because we search in Google instead of using a phone book. Um, anyone here actually remember phone books? I just use one to prop up the bookshelf. <laughs> But we don't look for that to solve a problem anymore. We use Google to solve a problem. And so when we're looking for a professional, when we want to know, oh, it's like, oh, professional headshot St. Louis, wedding photographer St. Louis. We're going straight to Google. We're going straight in here and we're oh, professional headshots in St. Louis. Like, that's what we're doing. That's the answer. So I would say that you definitely need to have a website and that needs to be search engine optimized so that you show up in Google appropriately. I also believe that this is a hub for all your social media because there's a, there's a controversy today in do I still need a website and that's so complicated, can't I just use Facebook, can't I just use Twitter, can't I just use Instagram? You don't own the platform. They change the algorithm, you are screwed. That's just real. They ban your account, you are screwed. Someone hacks your account, you are screwed. Hashtag, you are screwed. <laughs> so with that in mind, the safety is to have a personal website. The other thing about personal website, lets you build an email list. Thank God for email lists. By the way, I hate email. Um, I do, the, the user experience of email is horrible. But on the other hand, email lists are very viable, they're very practical, and it's direct access to someone. And I do appreciate the few email lists that I subscribe to actually are good because they're not overselling me crap, and they don't feel invasive, and they give me real value. 
And when I need to know something important that's happening in my industry or happening in the world, I'm grateful for them as the email that I actually look forward to opening. Be the email that people are interested and in looking forward to opening. Do not oversell them crap. Do not create a bad experience. Do not clog their inbox and everything like that because believe me, the day that there is a better user experience than email, I am gone. Gone. I will delete, 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 done, donezo. So you own your property. You have the access to be able to create a great email newsletter for people that they want that will allow you on some level to directly sell to them if you're giving value um, and that really matters. Obviously for everybody in here, you understand the value of a high quality press photo and that a press kit could be important. If any of you ever want sponsors or to do public speaking, you're not only gonna want great headshots, but you're gonna want to put together some kind of slide deck that communicates what you bring to the table, either for your sponsors or for uh, an event that you want to go to. So you're gonna have to create what's called a speaker sheet. Video is gonna be important for you guys if you ever wanna become a speaker or teach a workshop or a training because you need to be able to show proof. You need to be able to show yourself acting in the real world, doing the thing that you're selling to people as an instructor, as a trainer, as a practitioner. So you need to have a body of work. You need that proof in the same way that you need your portfolio with all of your gorgeous photography and headshots. You actually need in today's world with video marketing specifically um, getting ready to overtake online internet traffic in the next three years and represent 80% of all online video traffic in a world where YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world, the second largest trafficked website in the world period, and one of the largest ad distribution platforms in the world. I think it's kind of important to have video at this point. Not to mention every single social media platform has started implementing video and live video. So having some form of video content that demonstrates in the real world that you are a practitioner, even if it's just a two minute video. Think in the terms of putting together maybe a movie trailer or just a simple intro to you so that people can see your smile and see your personality and see who you really are and that you're friendly and accessible and approachable and not a pretentious starving artist. That matters. Your personality matters. So use video to communicate that. Uh, everyone should have a long, short, and medium bio. You should have a short bio that you can apply to all of your social media, that you can put in your Instagram, that you can put in your Twitter, that you can put in the title of your Facebook. You should have that, but it should contextualize, as I said earlier, not just all about me, but about me in the context of what I can provide and deliver for you. It's about them. What is the other person? What's in it for them? What do they get out of it? So make sure you're presenting in that way. Um, also a trick for the social media bios is to use a hashtag that is relevant to what you produce in your industry in the actual bio. So I, I think that that's important and maybe you can use keyword research in Twitter, search.twitter.com to be able to figure out what those might be or what the conversations are around your industry. Or sometimes they're just super obvious. In terms of how long a short bio should be, think about what someone would say about you if they needed to introduce you and they're not super familiar with what you're doing. What could they memorize or what could they put on a really simple cue card? My trick for that is a short bio should maybe be the length of two tweets. A tweet is 140 characters, so if it exceeds 240, 280 characters, it's probably too long for a short bio, um, so I think that's what it should be. I think a medium bio should be about 500 characters, and I think that a long form bio that would be on your about page maybe should be 300 to 500 words tops, personally. Uh, I don't really want to read a wall of text. Anybody here interested in reading a wall of text? No, I didn't think so. So um, those are some of the things. Logos are optional. Not as much for some of you guys because you are photographers and watermarks and things like that matter and branding matters, but I want you to understand that there are contexts where logos are optional. Primary example is for your social media profiles, having your great headshot is probably more advantageous in social media because in social media, we're trying to get away from companies. We want to deal with human beings because social media is just the way that we communicate today in the same way that we don't call this telecommunications, we call this talking. Okay, so I want you to kind of eliminate the word social media from your vocabulary and understand that one, it's just media and it's just conversations more than anything. It's just the way that we all talk, the way that we connect, the way that we all find a way to hang out with each other. I was explaining to someone earlier, he was um, a gentleman who said, well, I'm 60 and I don't get this social media stuff. And I'm like, okay, it's like high school. When you were in high school, you might have been in the photography club, you might have been on the school newspaper, you might have been the AV club, you might have been on the track team, Facebook groups, are just what, what club do you want to belong to today? Where do you want to hang out? Who do you want to sit with at lunch? That's what Facebook groups are. And if you can't find a group to belong to, you can obviously make your own for all the misfits. <laughs>
How you doing? I'm King Moon Racer, Island of Misfit Toys. Welcome aboard. So, I mean, I just feel that that's real. And like, anybody ever feel like that, by the way? That you're like, you're like you know, you're just a, I am not just a misfit. I am not just a nit. Wait, yeah, you guys will never get karaoke out of me. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, that's, that's real. So I feel that with social media, you're just going to find the like-minded people like you. You're just trying to find the people who are crazy, stupid, excited about what you want to talk about today so that you don't make your friends and family's ears bleed while you talk about megapixels and while you talk about double IS and while you talk about um, crop sensors and so on and so forth. You need to find the other nerds like you. And social media is a really good way to do that. It's practical. Also, it's a good way to find the people who want to buy what you're selling. And that's how I prioritize it. Now, with that in mind, Social media, like I said, we're trying to get away from companies, we're trying to get away from people that just want to sell us, but by building your influence, your authority, your value, if you are giving us that up front and we like you and we like hanging out with you, we're more likely to buy when you have something to sell because we want to support what you're doing and we believe in it and most likely it helps us get what we want. So it's about an alignment of values more than anything. So you have to create awesome things for people that are worth buying, that are worth sharing, that are worth consuming, that are worth their time. And by doing that, you create an awesome experience. And if you do that, then selling is relatively easy. It's again, an inevitability. So, you know, that's what I think. Uh, press kits. Press kits are valuable to brands that want to work with you. They're valuable to um, conferences. And again, I pointed out you need a speaker sheet and a speaker reel. I talked about social media and I talked about basically the religion of it. Let's talk about strategy. This is how humans communicate today. They want casual conversation. They want direct access to influencers like we talked about. They want to be able to say, hey, you know, can I ask a question? Can you help me or can you explain this thing to me that nobody else can seem to get me to my head? Can you make this less intimidating for me? That's valuable. The other thing is, in our space, in creatives, we value peer review. We value feedback from people that we respect and are doing the things that we're doing. We like people being able to evaluate our headshots. We like people being able to give us a little bit of guidance on our lighting, on our edits. And we like knowing and trusting that we're doing the right thing because as creatives, we are just predispositioned to second guess ourselves. That's just how we are. Our work is never perfect. It's never good enough. And what helps in that organic process is sometimes a little bit of reassurance, but also people who will tell us when we're wrong, people who will challenge us, people who will push us to go further, people who will like help us along the way. And so you can use social media to provide that, but you can also use social media to extract that for yourself to help you, you know, understand what you could be doing that could take things to the next level. A lot of times I figure out what the next thing that my community wants and what I should make for them because I'm listening. So you can use it as a listening tool as well. And you also have to understand that people value transparency more than ever today. And being active in social media means that you have to take a few things that you might have been thinking, oh, I'm keeping that close to the chest. And you might have to reveal some of that, humanize yourself and be accessible to people in a way that allows them to trust you and to feel safe with you. And maybe they then feel comfortable opening up to you and in all likelihood, they'll feel better about opening up their wallet to you down the road. So I would, value, I would encourage you to value that and to respect that people make a conscious choice about how they engage, who they engage with and where they are doing it. And that every social media platform has its own culture and that you need to um, understand the culture of the platforms that you are in and create unique value in all of those platforms. So many people just want to make one thing and then spam it to Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, Snapchat, and call it a day because that seems practical and it's not because it's not practical for the end user because I already saw that. I already got that there or I'm already following you here. Why should I follow you there? Unique value. What do I get from you here? How do you behave here? That's different than over here. Why should I hang out with you? Um, at the library and at the club. You know, you have to think about that. Why am I going to go here and keep following you? Well, if you keep giving me stuff that I want and you're giving me something that I can't get from you over here because the platform doesn't let you do it or the culture of the platform is different, that's a reason easily for me to follow you to somewhere else. It's easy, by the way, to jump from one ecosystem to another if you know that people are being authentic and real with you and that you can get something from them in one place to another. Primary example, q and A. I I do Q&A in multiple platforms, but the difference is this. There are platforms that make it easier when I do Q&A to link to resources and articles. 
Primary example, it is easier for me to do YouTube live videos and reference something that might have happened in the industry and have in the description for people multiple links so that when they're done watching this, they can do research on their own. Or that if I'm doing a live breakdown of some recent gear that I bought or that was released, they can go and they can find these things and start trying to hunt them down or making sure they have the product model right or the specs right. The information is right there for them. I do not have that capability when I live stream in Twitter. I do not have that capability while I live stream in Instagram. So it's a matter of understanding the unique differences of platforms and where you can deliver different value even if the content is very similar in its nature. The limitations and capabilities of the platform differentiate the value that you're able to give and why it matters to them and how they want to consume and what they want. The great thing about Instagram is you don't have to archive it and it's not automatically archived anymore which means that if you want to do something more humanizing, more goofy or more silly, where you are free to make a mistake, you can do that with the people that want to go deeper with you because it goes away. That's also the appeal of Snapchat, by the way. But YouTube, the value of it is search. It's a culture of search. It's, a, uh, it's an archive. It's basically your Netflix, which means that it's a resource. It's here forever if you want it to be. And it's actually the easier platform out of all those to monetize because you have ads and in YouTube Live, if you have a thousand subscribers, you have Super Chat and people literally can throw money at you. I'm not even kidding. So that's an interesting feature. Social media lets you listen. Most of my best ideas come from listening to my community. I never have to worry about what content to create, which I know is probably a struggle for many of you because I listen to the community. I actually like made a lot of this presentation based around the conversations that I've had with many of you throughout the entire week. I literally used examples in this presentation based on conversations I've had with many of you throughout the week and the actual things that you're trying to do to grow your business. And so if you listen to your community, if you use social media as a listening tool, then you can build a more authentic personal brand. It's easier to monetize because you won't be trying to sell something for which there's no demand. You won't sell something that people don't want. If you're listening to them and you're listening to what their problem is, then you can offer a solution that's worth buying. So I would encourage you to use social media as a listening tool. Practical example of that, Twitter hashtag strategies. If you are, go and look, if you're trying to solve problems for photographers, guess what? There's a hashtag called photographer problems. There's a hashtag photography problems. There's a hashtag um, photo fail. You could look at all these things and that will give you an idea of what problems people are having and how to solve them. It is extraordinarily practical to listen to people and to crowdsource the creation of your content by having ideas that don't even come from you, you might think there's a problem that needs to be solved and you could be completely wrong about that. You could be overestimating that problem. But if you go to the community and you can find enough use cases and you can find enough people that are screaming from the heavens about why this thing is so god awful, why this is so terrible, you can create the solution to that problem and then it's very easy because yes, take my money now, please. Primary example, if I literally could have um, uh, a flash trigger that I could actually use with my Apple Watch, this overpriced piece of thing right here, and I could just do this, and it would automatically take a selfie from the camera with the flash, and it would be the superior selfie because it's got everything, then that would be amazing. Why haven't they come up with that? Because they don't listen. So amplify your content. Social media is the ability to amplify and scale whatever you have. You guys already have a great portfolio and body of work. Social media is a great way for people to know about it and for them to care about it and then decide, hmm, you know what? That might be worth investing in. That's why using for uh, many of you, Instagram is so practical because it has reach and it has range. And there are many of you who have businesses beyond just shooting locally. Some of you can get within a tri-state area. Some of you, it might be because if you're showing off edits, maybe someone outside of your local community outsources the edits to you. So that's a very viable business model and thing. But if you're also creating products, which is why I emphasize that you should create products and you should create content, it means that you can monetize those things by amplifying your reach because it doesn't matter if somebody is a photographer in St. Louis or they're a photographer in Israel, if you have something that would help them with their lighting, if you have something that would help them with getting um, better autofocus, if you have something that would help them with producing a certain look or quality edit or HDR or drone photography, then guess what? It doesn't matter where they are. It doesn't matter where you are because you're delivering for them. And you have this amplification device that didn't exist 20 years ago to allow you to reach across the ocean and provide value, but also to make profit. It's right there for you. It's right there for every one of us in a way that was not true 20 or 30 years ago. It's why creativity is more practical than ever because engagement matters.
the ability to engage with people all around the world is accessible to every single creative in this room. Every single creative in this room can create awesome things, share them with the world, and rake in cash from across the globe no matter where they are. You can be in the smallest town in middle America and you can be making $100,000 because you have the opportunity to reach into everybody's phone directly. You can practically beam it into their freaking brain right now and if you are delivering for them, they will buy. They will engage. They will do that because all anyone wants is their life to get just a little bit easier. Just a little bit less anxiety in their life is all anybody wants. And if you are the answer to that problem, it's a foregone conclusion. It's a foregone conclusion. You just have to be the resource. You just have to put yourself out there. You just have to deliver. You know, easy, right? <laughs> So that is the core of the presentation before we get into Q&A. This is all of my social media stuff so that you guys can find me, follow me, connect with me. I'm also going to be out in the hall. You can feel free to talk my ear off for an hour after this. But with the time remaining, I want to do Q&A. I want the chaos. I want to answer your questions. I want to create awesome value for you guys. So after you're done with the snapshots, we'll just get into it. I'm going to grab this water here because I've been going nonstop for about an hour and 20 minutes running my mouth. I don't know how I pulled that off. Oh wait, I do, practice. So, yep, that's what I got. So without further ado, Q&A time. Anything you want to know about how to build your business, build your personal brand, how to monetize your message, let's do it. Yes? Uh, so you mentioned uh, YouTube live videos and having the ability to do descriptions. Uh, what are some kind of tips and tricks on why to do YouTube live, why to do Facebook live, live why to do Instagram live? What, what are the, the other leverages of those different live systems? That's a tremendous question. So you um, asked about differentiating the various live streaming platforms and uh, what we can do with those. And that, I think that that is an amazing question. Uh, I guess we're gonna do the mic so that uh, we can get people's questions clearly or is it that we're out of time or what's going on? You've got about 15 minutes of more time. Yes, so all right, 15 minutes of Q&A chaos, thankful. Okay, so differentiation of different live stream platforms. With YouTube Live, if you have a thousand followers in YouTube and you have ads activated, you can do what's called Super Chat. Super Chat means that while you're live streaming, while you're doing your Q&A, that people can literally donate money to you using Google Wallet. Two dollars, a buck, five bucks, 20 bucks. I think the most I've had anyone donate at one time is 50. Uh, I've done hundreds of dollars on every single live stream since they've implemented this feature. So in terms of direct monetization, I would say YouTube Live is more practical and more viable than most things. However, that 1,000 uh, subscribers is the barrier to entry for that and the ability to use it on your mobile phone the same way you would Periscope, Facebook Live, Instagram Instagram Live also requires at least a thousand subscribers as well. So that is part of the barrier to entry. However, the thing is, if you have at least a thousand subscribers, even if you only have 50 to 100 people watching during the live stream, there's a tremendous opportunity to make that uh, money through donations if your audience is that type of audience that is willing to do that. You'd be surprised how often people just are thankful to have a question answered. The other thing is YouTube Live is already by default monetized with ads passively anyway. And then because you can put long form descriptions in there, if you have a product or a course to sell or you have affiliate marketing links, those are there as resources. So that means that in doing a live stream in YouTube, you have anywhere from two to 10 ways to natively make money when you do a YouTube live stream. That may not be true. It's certainly not true if you do an Instagram live stream, but the value of an Instagram live stream is that you can be more human because it's not gonna be recorded forever. You can make mistakes, you can do something silly, and you can use it as build up and practice. Facebook could be valuable because maybe you want to live stream specifically to a group or if you have a membership group that you're charging for, which I encourage you to do, you can build a membership site um, capture money there, put some resources and downloads in the membership site, members only, but then the real value is the community group that you have in Facebook, private the group, they get an email when they sign up for that, and then you're also doing live Q&A once a week that's private, so that people feel safe and comfortable there because maybe they don't want certain things to be public, and it's just within the group, and then you could be um, doing like 30 or $60 a month for this private group, and you can do live streams in there, uh, you could do private live training in there because you could use uh, something to show your desktop, and so that would be the benefit of maybe a Facebook group live situation, or if you wanted to do that publicly, maybe it's to build credibility because maybe your audience is easier, more accessible in Facebook, and you can convert them there easily because the culture and audience of Facebook skews older and more affluent. So maybe that's the reasoning there. Um, in terms of Twitter Periscope, maybe it's just that you're able to write a hashtag, maybe you have community there, um, and maybe it's convenient when you're on the go uh, without thinking about it, and then you have the option to archive it or not. So those are the differentiations and that's where it might be practical. 
Uh, I do all of them, by the way, for exactly that reason, because I go where people want to be the way that they want to participate and I deliver value for them. But I also am the master of my time and productivity and thus I have the luxury of doing that. Anyone else? I would say prioritize whatever you feel generates the most revenue for you, what's the easiest place for you to convert or to make passive revenue, go there. That would be my answer. Does that help? I got one. Yes. In terms of what you were just talking about with the membership website and like private Facebook group and all that, do you, are, what, is, what are your thoughts about Patreon? And is, I mean, is it better to just go on your own through Facebook and those type of channels? Because from the service Patreon offers, I, I think they just take a small fee and then it's basically that type of membership model. Tremendous question. So the gentleman was asking about this thing called Patreon, patreon.com, and the way that that works is uh, people can donate to you and then you can set up a perks and reward system, etc., and they can be uh, members of your community there. The issue with that versus doing your own private membership site through platforms like Teachable, Kajabi, and Thinkific, uh, hashtag none of which are sponsoring, um, the reason that you might want to use those platforms are control, the fact that you could release products there as well that you then can sell to your members at a discount, which you can't necessarily do through the Patreon platform, um, and then the fact that uh, you are able to specifically versus with Patreon, it's kind of you'd have to almost go double opt-in versus with these systems you can directly add those people to an email list because they chose to buy. And so that's where I would go with that. And in a lot of cases, the uh, amount that the back end of the systems take through PayPal or Stripe or uh, Venmo is not in any way disproportionate to uh, comparatively to Patreon. So that's why I like those models better because I prefer you to have a system that you can control that also has an upsell opportunity. So that's the reasoning for that. And then in Facebook, Facebook is already a mobile community. Um, it's already accessible on your phone. Um, the audience is already there and built in. And so that's where I preference that model. But you certainly are open to do it whichever way you like or what's comfortable for you or what's comfortable for your community. The reason I uh, would go this route, even though it's slightly more complicated, is practicality and upsell opportunity. All right, anybody else? Yes, sir. Are you going to make your slide deck available? Slide deck is going to be available. Um, I'm going to get it to everybody here uh, on the admin team and they should be able to distribute it for you guys. And I'm also going to try and get this video presentation out on YouTube as soon as possible for you. And they also also going to make it available to Shutterfest so they can distribute it directly if that's viable. It's going to be a big file, so we'll see. <laughs> um, bu -bu 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 -bu. Looks like I got seven minutes. <laughs> Based on, like, yeah. I don't know. It's like, I mean, we could wrap up now if nobody has anything. I know some people got flights, but oh, we got, we got more questions. Okay, uh, tremendous question. What's a quick and easy software regarding video? All right, so here's a little known fact. There are a couple of free platforms that you can use. Uh, in terms of free, but is practical beyond your obvious Windows Movie Maker and iMovie for those of you who have certain uh, Apple ecosystem stuff that's legacy, uh, I actually would recommend uh, spark.adobe.com as a website. Uh, for not only video, but also for social media. As far as a simple solution, uh, you won't be able to do super advanced editing there, but it is a free web-based editor, which can be practical, especially if you're on the go. However, in terms of affordability, I personally believe that Adobe uh, Premiere Elements uh, for around 100 bucks is practical, CyberLink PowerDirector is practical, Corel Video Editor is practical, and um, those are the directions that I would tend to go. If you want to do screen recording and you're in Mac, uh, you could go with ScreenFlow. Uh, you also could uh, go with, uh, what's the competitor to uh, ScreenFlow that I'm thinking of? Um, but those are options and they're all in the $100 or so uh, price range. And so that's what I would recommend for you there. I prefer to use Adobe Premiere because many of you are already in the Adobe ecosystem. You already have a subscription to Creative Cloud and the tools work very well together. And for those of you who are video editors, uh, that, or rather that you're photographers who want to become video editors, when it comes to color grading your footage um, and when you're doing video, shooting in flat profile is close to shooting in raw. So I want you guys to think about shooting because I know that there's a tendency to want to get it perfect in camera, yeah? But the thing is, when you're doing all of that in camera for video, the problem is you're losing valuable data and it may not play back the way that it looks on your camera on everyone's screen or display. So what you're better off doing is shooting in a flat profile, which is close to shooting in camera raw when it comes to video content versus photography. And then 
Adobe Premiere has this great tool called the Lumetri Color Panel, which is basically the sliders from Adobe Lightroom. So then you can put an adjustment layer on that above your video track and then you can do color grading. So that is why I still use Adobe Premiere Pro, even though there are cheaper, better options. I love it and I still think that if you already have a Creative Cloud subscription, you got the full suite, definitely go ahead and use it. it makes life easier. If you want to scale down, then I've offered you, I think, maybe five other solutions that are around 100 bucks. Does that answer uh, that question for you? All right, awesome. Anybody else got a qu Yes. Online collaboration? All right, what's your question? Um, how do you feel about asking other vendors to send something like solo emails out if you're doing some sort of collaboration? How do I feel about other vendors selling, uh, sending solo emails or swipe emails out uh, if you guys are working collaboratively. One, I think it's a great idea to collaborate in general. I would rather collaborate than compete any day of the week. One, I only compete with myself. And then two, I think there's more than enough work to go around. I really do. So with that in mind, I think collaboration is great. I just think uh, you need to be very clear about what the quid pro quo is. What do you do for me? What do I do for you? Uh, what, be transparent. And I think that that's great. And I think that's a great way to reach into other people's ecosystems and deliver tremendous value. Uh, I think that it can have tremendous upside for both people as long as you structure the deal properly. So I actually am a big fan of doing those kind of things and I would encourage you more to do that. I would encourage all of you to try to think about how can I work together with somebody? How can I take uh, someone who might be say a web designer or a graphic designer and how can I help their clients utilize better photography? Uh, because maybe they have a great website and every single image on it sucks. Well, let's work together. Let's solve that client problem and everything like that. Hey, I've got a client that's an actor and I've done all these great pad shots for them, but you know that the website they're using to get their gigs is God awful. So why don't we partner together and why don't we bundle our services and why don't we go and look for more clients like that? Or why don't we actually send something out to each other's email list and why don't we pull our resources and both make more money? Like, I really think more of you should do that. I think you should collaborate. So I hope that answers that question. Uh, also, super quick hack for growing an email list by using videos and taking your free giveaway and free lead magnet and making a video that also adds that value and makes people aware that that thing exists, you can exponentially grow your email list real quickly if you do that. And if you do it often enough, maybe once or twice a month is enough depending on how much content you create. So that's a super quick hack for growing an email list using video content. You're welcome. <laughs> Anybody else? Back, person who said back here. Oh, yeah. So, um, do you have any recommendations for people that you know, haven't used blogs or anything like that in the past to kind of get these things going? Because it could sound like, you know, putting in more time to get those things up and running. Great question. All right, so the question was, what's my advice for anybody who's already investing a lot of time in their business, uh, needs to get these things up and running, hasn't done it before, how do you get started? Well, my answer to that is you have a couple of options. If you feel that you can audit your time and you can eliminate uh, other things that might have been wasteful time and you can learn this and you feel like you're a quick enough learner, I would suggest doing it. You'd be surprised how quickly you can get it done. Plenty of tutorials on YouTube. I've probably made a lot of them. That in, with that in mind, if you absolutely feel like you have no time, even if you audit and even if you did, you feel like that'd be better served in a revenue generating activity, then my answer to that is outsource it as quickly and as affordably as possible or look for someone in your community that owes you a favor or that you can do a trade with that can take that problem off of your plate or find a product or system or service that makes that simple. So that would be my answer. Does that help you out? Any recommended what? Do you have any uh, outsourcing places that you would recommend? Um, outsourcing places that I would recommend. First, I would try to partner with somebody in your network or ecosystem uh, in terms of who you know. If not, there are online communities that, um, that do this that you could reach out to. So I would specifically go and look for people in online communities if you don't have anyone in your personal network before you go to an actual website service. But typically, and people have mixed feelings about this, you could go to something like Upwork or 99designs. There are people who have conflicting feelings about this, but my answer is whatever works for you in your business, that's the right choice. And hey, you're gonna get no judgment from me. Just don't go to Fiverr. <laughs> that's, that's my only caveat there. But hey, if that works for you too, then you know, God bless. But I will judge you for that. <laughs>
All right, so do we got last and one more question before we get out of here before like, you know, Sal just like takes me off like stage. Nope. All right. So in closing, thank you so much, everybody. Great job as always, my friend. Good job.